Okay, thanks, Ali. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I prepared the talk and I realized that the title is very cryptic, so really what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about uh, my perspective, an algebraic perspective, linear algebra perspective, uh, on a new algorithm for solving linear, uh, linear equations. The new algorithm is not by me, it's my perspective on somebody else's algorithm. Uh, and the algorithm is a randomized graph algorithm for solving uh, linear equations. I was really delighted to be invited to this uh, workshop and I thought, uh, so thanks uh, Michael, and I thought uh, that you know, beyond the technical talk I maybe should uh, give something big, something slightly more general and I've decided to uh, offer an insight that obviously pertains to this particular talk, um, puts the talk in some sort of context, but hopefully slightly uh, more general and the, uh, the core of this uh, insight is that pra practitioners can take theoretical results, theoretical ideas, theoretical algorithms and turn them into really uh, fantastic software. So this is just the core, the full insight that this is true but only in theory uh, and in practice uh, this is often, uh, sometimes it's possible but often this is very hard uh, or impossible. I guess for theoreticians this is, this is, this is just fine, it's not uh, disconcerning at all because in theory all is well but for practitioners like me uh, there is an issue here. Now I'm not complaining uh, at all, um, I like this situation because really what it means is it means that I can uh, uh, read uh, theoretical papers, learn the, the theory, discover really exciting results, results that really excite me um, and sometimes the theoretician thinks that there is still a long way to go, sometimes the, th the theoretician may think that that's the end of the story and everything is done, but for me I know that there is still a way to go in terms of uh, doing really, in really interesting research to bridge the gap between the theoretical results and what's going on in practice and uh, the talk I'm going to, uh, to give today is really a talk that uh, where I'm going to walk through with you part of the way, not all the way to fantastic software, but part of the way uh, that Haim and I, uh, uh, with some help from Haim Kaplan, did to bridge this gap between uh, what was really a very exciting theoretical result and the fantastic software that we hope we'll be able to, uh, to deliver one day. Uh, so the setup is really very, very simple. We want to solve linear systems of equations. Ideally, we would want to solve linear systems of equation AX equals B without any side constraints, but this, was, this is a, a workshop on big data, uh, and Sergey said correctly uh, on Monday that we really want to try to focus on, on problems that we can solve in linear time or in log n or close to linear time. And unfortunately, even though these uh, linear systems are really the simplest type of uh, high dimensional problems that you can imagine, we don't know how to solve all of them uh, in anything close to linear time. So what do you do? You, you pile up uh, more side constraints. So let's assume that the matrix is also symmetric, that it's sparse, that it's semi-definite or positive definite, uh, which still, uh, uh, which, which is a class that still contains a lot of very important practical problems and it turns out that uh, even with all of those side, con side constraints we don't know how to solve them in anything close to uh, linear time. So we had one more constraint which really uh, should nail the coffin and that's that it's diagonally dominant. So diagonally dominant is really a very strong side constraint because what it means, it means that the matrix is fundamentally isomorphic to a, a weighted graph. Uh, and that gives an, uh, enough structure to come up with graph algorithms that really are very, very powerful. And uh, one, one subclass of diagonal and dominant matrices, which I'm going to focus on because it's easier to explain what's going on, uh, are Laplacians uh, of graphs. So here we have two graphs. Here is a two dimensional mesh. It's an unweighted mesh. I numbered the vertices. And if there is an edge between vertex i and vertex j, 1 and 2, then the matrix has an, a non-zero value in position 1, 2, or 6, uh, 7, there will be a position, a, a, 6, 7 will be non-zero. This graph is unweighted, so the absolute value of the off-diagonals is all 1s. The diagonal has the degree, the weighted degree. This is an unweighted version, there are weighted versions. Uh, and you can generate a Laplacian of any graph. This is a two-dimensional mesh, a three-dimensional mesh, and, and uh, you can create a Laplacian for um, unstructured meshes, expanders, any, any, any kind of graph. So we want to solve linear systems that are uh, isomorphic uh, to weighted graphs. Uh, so how do you solve linear systems? So we'll, we'll start with really ancient uh, history. 
So the, the, the history is really ancient, so it started something like two. Uh, these algorithms were invented. The first algorithms and algorithms that we still use every day were invented uh, something like 200 years ago uh, by Gauss and Cholesky. Uh, one idea is to factor the coefficient matrix into triangular factors. If the matrix is positive definite or semi-definite, you can factor it into a triangular factor and it's transpose. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Gauss didn't know about the big data, so he came up with an n-cubed algorithm. Uh, so this is really, okay, so no, big no-no. Uh, in the, uh, like John said yesterday, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, people realized that if the matrix is sparse, you can take advantage of that. Uh, there are very clever algorithms that, that uh, factor uh, sparse matrices, and if you specialize to, let's say, two-dimensional meshes, like the one I showed before, then it's much, much better. The complexity, arithmetic complexity, is much, much better than n cubed. It's n to the one and a half. For 3D meshes, it's n, uh, it's quadratic, n squared. So this is much better than Gaussian elimination on a full matrix, but still uh, too expensive for big data. Uh, another point which will uh, uh, which John said yesterday and is important in the rest of the talk is that uh, th these exponents, the complexity really depends on the size of uh, balanced vertex separators that you can find in the graph of the matrix. If the, if you have the matrix has small separators, then you can solve uh, the linear system very efficiently. If it doesn't have small separators, uh, you can solve this uh, efficiently. So in the roughly end of the 70s, early 80s, people uh, got to this point. Uh, it's great, but it's not... Uh, what you really hope for, so is there anything else? And the answer, the, the answer is yes, there is another completely different class of algorithms that actually precede this a little bit there from the 50s and 60s, uh, which are exemplified by conjugate gradient. There are a lot of them, but the most famous is conjugate gradient. These are iterative algorithms in which you have an approximate solution vector xt, and you repeatedly, iteratively uh, update it and, you know, in such a way that it converges to the solution x. The cost of each iteration is the number of non-zeros in the matrix A, or if it's uh, isomorphic to a graph, the number of edges, which I'll denote by M. So the, you, it's easy to understand the cost of each iteration. It's harder to understand how many iterations you need in order uh, for the solution to converge to something close to the exact solution. And it turns out that this depends on the distribution of eigenvalues of this matrix A. If the eigenvalues are clustered, then convergence will be rapid. If it's not clustered, convergence will be uh, slow. And this really is not a rephrasing of, of Gauss's ideas in any form or shape. This is really completely different. And the way I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, convince you, try to convince you that this is really completely different, is by uh, saying or uh, uh, by mentioning that these algorithms are faster on 3D meshes than on 2D meshes. So what was hard for Gaussian elimination is easy for this. And this is exactly for the same reason. So if the matrix has uh, large separ doesn't have small separators, then conjugate gradient converges quickly. If it has small separators, then it's great for sparse Gaussian elimination, but not good uh, for con conjugate gradient. So this is, uh, this is really completely different, but it turned out to be really way, way too slow on many meshes, many, many uh, practical problems. Uh, and the next idea was to say, okay, so we have these two completely different classes of algorithms. Can we mesh them together in some way that the overall algorithm will, take be, uh, will enjoy the benefits of both of them. Uh, and this turned out to be uh, possible using a technique from the 60s and 70s uh, called preconditioning. So the idea is you say, okay, so the coefficient matrix is A, and if it was very, very sparse or had small separators, I would factor it and, and, and solve the linear system, but it's too expensive to factor. Can I find an approximation, P, preconditioner? So I, can I find an approximation of A called P, I'll denote it by P, so that I can afford to factor P into triangular factors, and then I'll use this factorization to transform the linear system to an equivalent linear system, but which has a different coefficient matrix, this L inverse A, L to the minus transpose, which really fundamentally is a symmetric version of P inverse A. So if P is similar to A, then you expect P inverse to be similar to A inverse and P inverse A to be close to the identity. And it turns out that if it's close to the identity, it doesn't need to be close to the identity in matrix space. It needs to be close in, to the identity in the sense that its eigenvalues are clustered. The identity has just one eigenvalue that's repeating many times, one. Uh, so if the eigenvalues of this coefficient matrix are clustered, this, this will converge very quickly, and hopefully you can find a P uh, so that factoring it will be much faster than factoring A. Uh, when people discover this, uh, this scheme, 
uh, they started looking for ways to construct P. And for many years, the only ways to construct P were either heuristics, in which it was very difficult to say anything concrete about the convergence rates, or uh, it was very problem specific. Uh, until in 1991, the theory community came up with a really cool algorithm to construct these matrices P, these preconditioners, in a way that allows uh, for a very satisfying analysis of the convergence rate and the total, uh, total uh, solution cost. Let me describe the basic algorithm, it's very simple. So we have a mesh here, and we notice that the mesh is isomorphic to a graph. So it's not just that the matrix has a graph of its non-zeros, it's an isomorphism. So anything you do on the mesh really corresponds to something algebraic that you do on the matrix, and what's more natural if you are looking for small separators to say, okay, this doesn't, the smallest separator here will be 11, uh, 11 vertices. Let's try to drop some of the edges to make the separator smaller. So you can start with this coefficient matrix and sparsify it. So here we've sparsified it all the way to, uh, to a tree. If I d delete this vertex, for example, I chop it into two roughly equal uh, parts by just removing one vertex. So factoring this thing is going to be very easy. Now, what about the, uh, these eigenvalues of P inverse times A? Well, it doesn't look, th that tree doesn't look that much uh, like A, so probably the eigenvalues are not going to be very clustered, and you can prove that they're not going to be very clustered, but you, you don't have to be that greedy, so you can look for something like this, where it's still meshy, it still looks like a mesh, it's still pretty similar, but still uh, the separator is now half the size, uh, and here the separator is even smaller. Uh, and it turns out that there is a way to analyze rigorously these preconditioners, and they're based on a very important idea which is going to play out throughout the talk, so you have to pay attention to this, and the idea is that you change the representation. You don't do any work. It's not an algorithm. You just change the representation of the problem from what is effectively the adjacency matrix of, matrix of the graph to the incidence matrix of the graph. So U is an incidence factor. It's a uh, matrix. It's a uh, short and fat matrix. The rows correspond to vertices in the graph, and the columns correspond to edges in the graph. And the column that corresponds to edge E, which is IJ, has just two non-zeros, uh, the square root or the square root of the absolute value of AIJ, and minus the square root of the absolute value of AIJ. And it turns out that if you take the outer product of, of this column and its transpose, which, what happen, which is what happens here, you reconstruct the original matrix. So we moved from one representation, algebraic representation of the graph to another representation of the graph. And this, uh, this was key to a discovery in 2003, so the combinatorial preconditions uh, started in 1991 using a, a fairly complicated type of analysis, but in 2001, Bowman and Hendrickson uh, used these incidence factors to come up with a very clean, neat, and useful way to characterize the convergence rate of these algorithms, and what they said is they said, okay, we have this incidence factor U, and we're using a subgraph as a preconditioner, so let's uh, order the columns of U so that the subgraph, the basic uh, variables, the, bas the basic uh, edges show up first, and then there are the edges that we've dropped, the non-basic edges. So P is really the outer product of the incidence factor UB times UB transpo transpose. And uh, if it's a spanning subgraph, then there is a matrix W that transforms this incidence uh, factor into the original incidence factor. And it's very easy to see that uh, you can construct these Ws from path embedding. So convincing yourself that such a W exists is, is really uh, pretty easy. And once you do this, you can construct W any way you want. Once you do this, you can show that the bound on the, that the um, eigenvalues of this uh, preconditioned matrix lie between 1 and the 2 norm of W. So it gives you a bound on the clustering of the eigenvalues of the preconditioned system. Uh, now, the two norm is kind of hard to estimate, but you can bound the two norm by other norms, and these other norms, like the infinity norm, the one norm, the Frobenius norm, are related to combinatorial properties of the embedding from which you construct the W, like congestion, dilation, stretch, other uh, graph embedding properties. So that gives you a tool to really look at the two graphs, do graph reasoning, and come up with an algebraic bound on the spectrum of the preconditioned system, and with this uh, technique and also earlier more complicated techniques, people came up with a whole bunch of algorithms to sparsify graphs in a way that's useful in this context. 
uh, maximum spanning trees, all kind of uh, ex uh, constructions like the one I showed before are due to Anil Joshi. The one I want to point out is these low stretch trees. So low, st low stretch trees, uh, Bowman and Hendrickson uh, realized at the same time that they discovered these Ws, uh, they discovered that low stretch trees uh, have uh, good bounds on the Frobenius norm, which translates into a good bound on the, on the, on the two norm, which con uh, translates into rap rapid convergence. Okay, so that, uh, that's, not, none of this is really new, but in uh, a couple of months ago, Haim uh, said, okay, have you seen this uh, very exciting result from Stoke 2013 uh, by uh, John Kellner, Orechia, Sid Ford, and Jude, uh, John Kellner and a couple of his students. Uh, what was, so I said, no, I looked at the paper. Uh, what's the paper? The paper is really about a new algorithm, and now you can understand why we got so excited. I mean, this is a, a problem that people have been solving, inventing algorithms for, uh, for since Gauss's time, and it's uh, not clear that there is anything new to discover here. And they claim that they have a new algorithm. Very exciting for us. Uh, the algorithm is iterative, so I said, okay, it's, it must be some rephrasing of these old algorithms from 1991, 2004, and so on, but no, it's a different algorithm. It doesn't use conjugate gradient. It doesn't use anything like conjugate gradient. It's iterative, but not conjugate gradient. Uh, the analysis was completely new, doesn't, didn't build on any of the earlier analysis. It, 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 it was based on some kind of uh, electrical reasoning, which to me, as a person uh, versed in linear algebra, seemed kind of weird. I've seen it before used as a, as a motivation, but not really as an analytical tool. Uh, so is it completely new? It says it's completely new, but it uses these low stretch trees. Where did they come up from? I mean, is it somehow related to the old results, can I use my insights about these old results, 10 or uh, 20 years of research, is there anything useful in these old results? But if the result is cast in a completely new uh, type of analysis, it's, it was very hard for us to understand whether it's related and how it's related to all the results. And because of this uh, hint, the low street trace, I said, okay, it must be closely related to things that people did before, but it just expressed in a different way, and Haim and I, uh, searched and found a way to express this in a way that's more understandable to us, hopefully more useful in, in implementations, and reveals the structure, the relationship between this result and earlier results. Uh, so that's what I'm going to show. So what's the, what's the algorithm? The algorithm is really weird. So you start uh, with this uh, matrix, which I said you can express as a, uh, either A, the adjacency, or the outer product of the incidence factors. It's just a different representation, no comp computation here. And you start, so, but this matrix is n by n, and this is n by m, uh, so it's larger. So you take this uh, fit larger matri matrix, and you say it's not large enough, I'm going to make it even larger. So you expand it into a square, square matrix that's m by n, number of edges by the number of edges. You make the linear system much bigger, and you expand it, so here's the u, the u block, you, you add an n block, to make it square and full rank, and you do this in a very specific way, which sounds very hard. You add the basis for the null space of, of u. So you take the rows of, the, you take u, and you find the basis uh, for the null space, so u times n transpose should be zero. It, normally it's hard to find null space bases. You turn this into a bigger matrix, and then you take that bigger matrix as the coefficient matrix of a new linear system, kf, equals 0b, and I'll refer to this 0b as a right-hand side called g, uh, and you solve this linear system, which is bigger than the original. Once you solve, uh, f satisfies two block equations, uf equals b and nf equals 0. uf equals b means that f is orthogonal to the null space of, uh, to, is, f is orthogonal to the, to the null space n, which is the null space of u, which means that in, it is in the row space of u, or the column space of u transpose, which means that there is an x such that u transpose x equals f. Turns out that because of the incidence structure of u, it's easy to find that x. If you have f, finding x is easy. So first you, you construct n, then you solve this linear system, you find f, then you find x, that's easy, and now because you have the equation uf equals b, that's uf, uf is u times u transpose x, which is ax equals b, and you've solved the problem. Obviously, this complicated scheme only makes sense if solving kf equals g 
is guaranteed to be easy, and that's the way they've constructed this algorithm in a very clever way that guarantees that maybe solving AX equals B is easy or hard, doesn't matter, solving KX equals KF equals G is always easy. Okay, so uh, how do they solve KF equals uh, G? They went back uh, to an algorithm for 1937, which is really a, a version of a general scheme from the 19th century called constraint relaxation iterations, which really is the easiest thing you can think of. You take, the, you take an approximate solution F, which still doesn't satisfy KF equals G. You say it doesn't satisfy the equation. Let's find one equation that it doesn't satisfy. So you say, okay, let's look at the ith equation. Does it satisfy the i equation? No. Let's fix the approximate solution F so that it satisfies this equation. Maybe this ruins uh, satisfaction of other equations, but you don't care about this. You just do this and repeat. There are several uh, ways to do the update, to update the approximate solution F or FT uh, to satisfy equation I. So there's uh, Jacobi relaxation. That's the easiest one. You modify the diagonal element FI. Uh, they uh, used an algorithm called uh, Kajmaj, which corrects uh, the solution uh, by adding a scaled copy of the row that is not satisfied. So you look at the row times your approximate solution, and if it's not satisfied, you take that sparse row and you add a, um, a scalar multiple of it to your approximate solution to make it, uh, to, to satisfy the equation. This has a geometric, this is a projection, it has a geometric reasoning on why it makes sense to do this, uh, which is not really important in this talk. It, it, you're basically moving F as little as possible in uh, in Euclidean space to satisfy that equation. So they're using uh, this equation, so, so they're uh, using this uh, method by Kajmash. Uh, and they use this method by Kajmash in, Kajmash in a very specific way that's important uh, for ensuring that, this, that the algorithm runs fast on KF equals zero. What they do is they start from an F zero, which they find using a, 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 uh, another algorithm which is really easy, not uh, very complicated. So they start from an initial guess that satisfies u f equals b. So it satisfies the top, the top equations, but not the bottom equations, n f equals something else. I denoted it by z, which is in general not, uh, not zero. And it's easy to see that when you run Kajmaj on this matrix, because this is a, a, a basis for the null space, it uh, f t always satisfies this equation. u times f t always equals b, z, the bottom part is not zero, but it converges to zero. And the reason it happens is very easy. If you pick an equation that's in the U block, it's already satisfied. This is the invariant. And if you pick an equation N times one of the rows of N times F uh, should be equal to zero. It's not zero. You, you fix X, you fix F, but you, what you do to F is you add a vector that's in the null space of U, so it doesn't make, it doesn't uh, violate the equation U F equals B. So you're always remaining in that invariant uh, subspace. Okay, so that's the, that's, the, that's the algorithm. There is nothing more to the algorithm, but there are three hard questions. One is how to construct N cheaply. In general, it's hard, it's expensive to construct uh, null space bases. Uh, how, how many iterations will this take and how to run them very efficiently? So the, uh, how did they construct the null space bases? They split, and now this is our explanation of what they do. They would explain this in a completely different way. But what they're really doing is they're doing this splitting of u into the basic and non-basic uh, variables where ub represents a spanning tree. And therefore it has a, this matrix w that you can construct combinatorially that will transform ub into u. And obviously because u, ub shows up here and also shows up here, this w has a lot of structure. Uh, it's leftmost block is the identity. So you have an identity times the, uh, and then the interesting part of N, which I of W, which I denoted by WN. Once you come up with this expression, it's very easy to show these three lines to show that not this matrix, not W, but a, 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 some derivation of it, minus WN transpose I is a null space basis. And you prove this just by multiplying by U and you get the zero, which means that it's a, um, that it's uh, a null space basis. Now, how do you construct WN? Uh, I basically said this before, you construct WN using a path embedding. So because every column in UE, whether it's a basic or non-basic, has two non-zeros, 
uh, and all the columns in U have two non-zeros. Basically, you line up columns so that the non-zeros cancel out until you get uh, the two non-zeros at the end. Uh, it's trivial to derive those coefficients. Basically, a column of U specifies a path in the tree that connects the two endpoints of the edge that you dropped, that you're trying to express uh, algebraically. Now, what would make uh, a good N? Uh, something that makes Kajmaj converge quickly. And the convergence of Kajmaj is determined by or bounded by the con some condition number of the coefficient matrix K by the Frobenius norm of the matrix times the two norm of the inverse of the matrix uh, for uh, in this application because the reason they started from this special U0 is to make not all of K matter but only the N part because really you're iterating, you're running Kajmaj on a rectangular matrix this N matrix, the U part, really doesn't pay any, any role in the iteration. So what you want is you want an N with a small sum of squares, that's the Frobenius norm, and that cannot make vectors small, that's the two norm of the pseudo inverse, and it turns out that this matrix is good, uh, the, the pseudo inverse is, is never, uh, never, uh, never too large uh, because of the I block here, and the Frobenius norm is really the Frobenius norm of WN, which is the stretch of the tree. So that shows you why they chose the low stretch tree, and it shows that the, the choice of the low stretch tree and the structure of the algorithm is really completely uh, built on, those, on that matrix W, which was the matrix that was used to analyze uh, the combinatorial uh, graph uh, preconditioner since uh, 1991, or since 2003 when it was uh, discovered. So that's why they use a low stretch tree because it, it, makes, it makes sure that the null space basis is a null space basis that makes Kajmaj converge uh, quickly. Uh, now, it, um, the other really very important advance that they made was a way to run Kajmaj iteration, uh, iterations in a way that makes every iteration very, very cheap. Uh, and to do that, they looked at the expression. So they say, okay, so we are going to update f. How is f updated? f is updated by a scalar multiple alpha of the row that we are trying to fix. K, the, we are trying to fix row i. How do you choose alpha? You choose alpha uh, using this uh, formula, which ensures that uh, you satisfy uh, equation i. And most of the terms here, in terms of the uh, progress of the iterations, are constant. You can pre-compute them ahead of time, uh, gi, uh, this uh, this dot product, uh, this sum of squares, they're all fixed. The only thing that's interesting in this part, this is an, a dot product between constants that lie on the path in the graph. They depend both on the path and on the edges that you traverse times the current solution. And what they tried to do was to come up with an abstract data structure that supports three abstract operations. One operation computes those dot, pro uh, those dot products. So basically you wanted to create a data structure data structure that's an oracle that you can say, here is a path in the tree. What's the dot product of my current vector along that path? That's one operation. The other operation is say, okay, uh, it should be, the dot product should be some one thing, but it's something else. Let's modify the flow, the, this f along the path, so that it would satisfy the equation by adding alpha times ki. And at the end, th this is a, the f is represented implicitly in this data structure. At the end of the algorithm, you really need f as a set of numbers, as a vector of n numbers, so you need to be able to, uh, to, uh, to output them, but you need to do this only when you, when you decide to stop the iteration, so this, you can do this when you tear down the data structure. You don't need to do this efficiently all the time. Now, so it looks almost doable, but it was not doable because here, this k, in, in this inner product, K, the indices of K are I and J. So it means that the inner product is between the current uh, solution vector and constants that lie on the path in the tree, but the constant depends both on the edge that you're traversing in the path and on the path, on the endpoints of the path. And there is no, uh, nobody knows how to do this uh, abstract data structure efficiently, but they discovered that uh, you can do an algebraic transformation. I won't show it here. It's, uh, uh, too detailed, it's not very complicated, but too detailed, uh, in a way that removes the I index from the coefficient here. So you can move to basically a different space in which these dot products involve constants that belong to the edges. So you have a tree, every edge of the, in the tree has a constant 
and the variable, and what you're doing is you're taking uh, pads in the tree and you're computing the dot product of the constant times the variable along the path, five minutes, uh, summing this up, uh, getting, getting a constant that you turn into alpha, and then you update the path uh, using a structured uh, way that a data structure can, can do efficiently. Uh, and they, th their data structure can do this in O of log n. It's a really interesting data structure. It's not that complicated. Uh, they, they are very adamant in the paper saying that it's not very complicated. Uh, there is a reason that they're so insistent. And the reason is that it's a special case of a g very general data structure called dynamic trees that it was invented by uh, Slater and Tarjan. Uh, and when I, when I uh, so I said, okay, I, I looked at this, I, I, it was hard for me to understand. They explained how to do this. It was hard for me to explain. Uh, and we have in my department uh, a, a, an expert in data structure, uh, Heim Kaplan, who was a student of Tarjan. So I said, okay, I'll take this to, uh, to Heim and ask him how, how it's done. What's the data structure? And he said, oh, dynamic, data, dynamic trees. Nobody uses dynamic trees. They're way too complicated. Uh, <laughs> I said, oh boy. But then we read the paper carefully together uh, and we realized that uh, John Kellner's uh, claim is absolutely correct, that here the tree doesn't change. So this application of the dynamic data structure is really uh, simple, it's implementable, it's, it's, it's not complicated and uh, we figured this out completely. So, so, uh, so it, it's based on something very complicated but it's a simple instantiation. Okay, we've got to my last slide, which is two slides wrapped in one because Ali is saying that uh, I ran out of time. Uh, so the summary is really interesting. It's an, it's, it is a very exciting new algorithm. It's not directly related to combinatorial preconditioners uh, that were invented over or developed over 20 years. It is using low stretch trees, and that's not a coincidence. It's because of fundamentally the same basic reason, and that is that that uh, transformation matrix W, which here is used as a null space basis, and in, uh, in, in combinatorial preconditions is used in, a, in another way. Uh, you want a null space basis, this W, with a small norm. That's how uh, Bowman and Hendrickson came up with low stretch trees, and that's how uh, Kenner and students uh, came up with uh, low stretch trees. There are uh, two key ideas. One which they express in one way, which is that they have a combinatorial method to transform an ill condition, the hard, small problem, to a larger, easy problem. And the way that I'm re uh, expressing this, which hopefully will be uh, useful in the future in generalizations of this, is that this is a null space method. You take the problem, you create a null space of the relevant part of the matrix, and that gives you the power to turn a hard problem into a bigger, easy problem. The other part that's very important and, as far as I know, completely new in linear algebra, in algorithms in linear algebra, is an implicit way to represent the iteration vector rather than an explicit representation to make iterations uh, cheap. Uh, we've started doing uh, experiments with this. It seems to have large constants. Convergence seems very slow, so it's linear in the number of edges, but linear with the large constant. And the other thing that I want to mention here, which is also critical to the question of whether we can turn this into fantastic software, is whether this is the way they describe the algorithm, the way I currently understand the, the algorithm, it's inherently very, very sequential. It, it's doing uh, a linear number of iterations. The iterations themselves are very cheap. That's not good uh, in terms of parallelism. So unless we can find uh, a parallelized version and hopefully a parallelized version that's provably parallel and provably effective rather than a heuristic, uh, this is not going to turn into fantastic software. So, so there is a lot of work to do here. Thank you very much. Um, here, I don't know. I mean, in, it, well, it depends what kind of factors you have. The incidence factors are really not something that's challenging computationally. It's just a different way of representing the matrix. So you can represent it as an array of matrices or as a linked list. Or, so the U factors are really exactly the same representation. So it's not doing anything so yet. If, if you have factors that are triangular factors or something useful, that, that could be useful maybe here, but we don't know. <laughs> 